Hello, Clinic Review family from me and my puppy, Koopa. Hello, Clinic Review family. I'm very happy to meet you. Do you want to meet my other dog too? Come on, Prince. Come on. Good boy. You want to say hi too? Huh? You want to say hi? This is my other puppy, Barkley. So if you hear barking in the background, these are my pups. Oh, this is a sweet baby. Mwah. All right, get down. All right, we are doing pediatric prioritization questions today. And uh, I do want to say thank you to all of our channel members. And I am doing um, next-gen tutoring through Clinic Reviews. So you can go to clinicreviews.com and sign up for my next-gen tutoring if you want to. It does cost money, uh, but it is available to you if you want to. So let's go ahead and get started with the questions without any further ado. All right, a nurse is working in a pediatric clinic. Which of the following infants would the nurse see first? A two-month-old with a slight yellowish tint to the skin, a nine-month-old who is not sitting without support, not yet sitting without support, a four-month-old with a persistent cough and wheezing, a 12-month-old who is not yet walking independently. All right, so I read the question, I read the answers, and then I read the question again. A nurse is working in a pediatric clinic, which of the following infants should the nurse see first? So the most important uh, word in the question is first. Who would you see first? And you always see the unexpected symptoms or the unstable patient or the patient with a changing assessment. Okay, so you don't see the, the patient who has expected symptoms or who um, is stable or whatever. Okay. So we're looking for the unstable patient, the unexpected findings or the changing assessments, two month old with a slight yellowish tint to the skin. All right. So that's not expected. So we're going to keep that on our list of possibilities. A nine month old who's not yet sitting without support. So that's not expected. So we'll keep them on the list. A four month old with persistent cough and wheezing. That's not expected. So we'll keep them on our list. A 12 month old who's not yet walking independently. I would say that's okay. Um, there's lots of kids who aren't walking yet at 12 months independently. So that's fine. So we're going to cross off D because that's totally fine. It's developmentally appropriate. So A is a physiological problem. B is a developmental problem. And C is a physiological problem. So I would prefer to see the person with the physiological problem before the developmental problem. So I'm going to cross off B. So now I have to choose between a physiological problem in A and a physiological problem in C. Now, there's one prioritization strategy that all nursing students seem to know, and that's the ABCs. The only times the ABCs work is when you're trying to decide between two physiological problems. And both of them are acute problems because you always choose the acute over the chronic. So if you had two physiological problems and one is acute and one's chronic, I'd go with the acute one. It doesn't matter if it's respiratory or not. Okay, doesn't matter. I go with the acute over the chronic. Here we have two acute problems and they're both physiological. So the only time you can choose between, the only time you can use ABCs in was when you're choosing between two acute physiological problems. And so I'm going to have to choose a persistent cough uh, and wheezing over the slight yellowish tint to the skin, okay? Because that's the acute physiological problem. It's not expected and it's respiratory. So what did you learn there? You learned that when you're trying to decide between who to see with four people and it says, who do you see first? The most important word is first, right? First is the most important word. So who? You, how do you make a decision? Well, it's either an unexpected problem or a changing assessment and acute problems are worse than chronic problems. And if you have two acute physiological problems, not developmental, not develop because B and D are both developmental problems. So not developmental problems, but two acute physiological problems, you can finally use the ABCs. You, that will actually work for you. All right, question two, a nurse is providing education on feeding practices for infants. Which statement by the parent indicates a need for further instruction? All right. I don't know why need is capitalized there, but further instruction, that's further means false. So F always goes with F. Further instruction means the false statement. Infants. When the age is in the question, particularly a pediatric question, I pay attention to the age. This is an infant, and we're looking for the false statement. 
I'll start introducing pureed vegetables to my six month old. I'll give my four month old some water in a bottle during hot days. I'm planning to breastfeed my baby until he's at least a year old. I'll avoid giving my baby honey until she's over a year old. All right. A nurse is providing education on feeding practices for infants, which statement by the parent indicates a need for further instruction. So we're looking for the false statement. So which is false related to infants? Introducing pureed vegetables to my six month old. That's totally fine. That's when you can start introducing pureed foods. They, they don't call baby foods on the NCLEX. If they call the baby foods on the NCLEX. That'd be easy. But uh, pureed foods are baby foods. That's what they are. So that's totally fine. That's a true statement. I'll give my four month old some water in a bottle during hot days. All right. We are not supposed to give straight water for rehydration, especially when they're hot and sweaty. Um, they need something with some electrolytes in it. So that's not a good idea really for anybody. I would probably not give straight tap water to anybody to rehydrate on a hot day. So this is not even a pediatric issue. It's just a straight up issue. So I don't like B. I'm planning to breastfeed my baby until he's at least a year old. Totally fine. No problem. So I'm crossing off C. I'll avoid giving my baby honey until she's over a year old. That's fine as well. And I can't remember. Somebody put it in the, in the comments. I can't remember why they can't have honey. But that's fine. That's that is a rule. Um, so the only one that I don't like is B. So that's the only false statement. I don't I don't like giving uh, water. That, and I'm assuming it's tap water because if it wasn't tap water, they would say something else. Okay. All right. Next question. A nurse is conducting a teaching session on injury prevention for parents of infants. Which of the following topics is the highest priority? All right, the highest priority. So which is the most important for the parents of, to teach parents of infants? Avoiding walkers to prevent fall related injuries. Avoiding walkers. Keeping small objects away to prevent choking. Introducing soft toys without batteries for play. Setting up baby gates once the baby starts crawling. So these are, except for one, I don't know what that's all about. Um, except for one, they're all good. A nurse is conducting a teaching session on injury prevention for parents of infants. Now, when I think of infants, I guess an infant is up to one year old. I guess that's true. Neonates, newborns are up to a month and infants up to a year old. So I guess that's, I guess that's right. All right. So I'm going to cross off A. That doesn't make much sense to me. Keeping small objects away to prevent choking. So this is really a best question saying which topic is the highest priority. And these are sort of hard questions because it's not always clear what the highest priority is. You should see when you see a best question, like what's the best nursing action or what's the best thing to teach. You should say to yourself, I'm going to see more than one answer that I like. I'm going to see more than one answer that I like. So I like B. I don't think C is not striking me as a high priority. It's just not, but I like D. Okay. So, so what do you do when you get a best question like this is you say, I'm going to do one, but I'm never going to do the other one. So I'm going to keep small objects away to prevent choking, but I'm never going to set up baby gates once they start crawling, or I'm going to set up baby gates once they start crawling, but I'm never going to keep small objects away to prevent choking. Okay. Which do you think is, which one do you want to say? Yeah, I don't want to tell the national council of state boards of nursing. I'm never going to do that. Which one do you want to tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing? I'm definitely going to do that. So I definitely want to tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing that I'm going to prevent small, keep small objects away. Because keeping small objects away to prevent choking is absolutely fundamental. Setting up baby gates is not a fundamental principle because they may not have any stairs. Uh, I mean, it just depends on the house, right? Like, do you need baby gates everywhere? You really don't. It just depends. I mean, you can lock all your cabinets and there's other ways to keep your kids safe other than just baby gates. But you absolutely have to keep small objects away to prevent choking. That is a fundamental principle. And I don't want to tell them that I'm not going to do that. All right, next question. Which interventions are appropriate when administering medication to infants? Again, first year of life. Select all that apply. Use a medication dropper for accurate dosing. Administer medication directly into the infant's mouth. Mix medication with formula to mask the taste. Offer a pacifier dipped in medication after, huh? after administration. E, dilute medication with water to, to reduce concentration. Which interventions are appropriate when administering medication to infants? Select all that apply. So I'm going to turn this into a series of true-false statements. That's what you should do when you have a SATA question. 
So I'm going to, I will teach, oh, appropriate. Uh, I will use a medication dropper for accurate dosing when I give meds to an infant. I'd say that's true. That sounds true to me. You might say, well, is it a dropper or is it a syringe? Y'all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're, they're essentially the same thing. So I'm going to use a medication drop for accurate dosing with infants. Absolutely. Because I want absolutely accurate dosing because it's going to be small differences depending on their weight. I'm going to administer medications directly into the infant's mouth when I give meds to an infant. Yeah, that's what we do. Where else would I give it? Right into the, me right into the mouth. True. I'm going to mix medication with formula to mask the taste when I give medications to infants. I'm going to put a question mark next to that one because I, you have to remember when we're doing NCLEX questions that we're not testing how we do things in real life. Like you might say, well, I did that for my kid. Okay, that's fine. But the question, is that a rule that I need to make sure I n tell the National Council of State Boards of Nursing I'm going to follow? I don't think it is, but I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to offer a pacifier dipped in medication after administration of medication to infants. That makes no sense to me whatsoever, that, that option. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would I dip it after it? Yeah. D is out. I'm going to dilute that med medication with water, reduce the concentration. I'm absolutely not going to do that because I need to give the concentration that's ordered. So I'm not going to reduce the concentration. I... So I'm just doing A and B. It's not saying, can you do it? Remember, you can do anything. But these are things that really you have to do, right? Or they're appropriate to do in administering because it doesn't tell you the med. And since it doesn't tell you the med, you have to think generally. So in general, do I mix medication with formula to mass taste? I do not do that. In general, do I dilute medications with water to reduce the concentration? I do not. In general, do I use a medication dropper for accurate dosing? Yes. In general, do I administer meds directly into the infant's mouth? Yes. So when you're not sure, add the word in general to the answer and see if it doesn't help you. That helps me a lot, a lot of times. Which signs indicate respiratory distress in an infant? Nasal flaring, heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 40, oxygen saturation 98%, chest retractions. Okay, which signs indicate respiratory distress in an infant? Nasal flaring. Yes, true. Nasal flaring indicates respiratory distress in an infant. True. I hope I, hope I don't have to explain that to you. I can say in general if it helps you. In general, nas nasal flaring indicates respiratory distress in an infant. Yes, true. In general, a heart rate of 110 indicates respiratory distress in an infant. No, a heart rate of 110 is normal uh, for an infant. In general, respiratory rate of 40 breaths per minute indicates respiratory distress in an infant. False, because infants have quite high respiratory rates. They go up to like 45 or 50 for normal, something like that. It's, so no, that's not true. In general, an ox oxygen saturation of 98% indicates respiratory distress in an infant. False, that's normal. In general, resp in general chest retractions indicate respiratory distress in an infant. Well, uh, true, true. That's true. So those two. So I don't know if it helps you. I hope, I hope for those of you that it helps to say in general with SATA questions, I hope you see that it's helping you. It helps me. I don't know if it helps everybody, but it helps me for sure. So if it helps you, that's great. A six month old infant is being assessed for developmental milestones during a well child visit six month old. Which milestones should the nurse expect the infant to have achieved by this age? Select all that apply. Rolling over from front to back. Sitting without support. Using a pincer grasp. Displaying stranger anxiety. Walking with assistance. Okay. One of my favorite questions. Developmental milestones. All right. So what would we have expected a six-month-old to be able to do? So here's what I think of when I think of developmental. So I think of holding their head up. You can hold their head up. Then they roll from front to back. I'm sorry, from abdomen to back, because I remember A to B. They roll from the abdomen to the back and then the back to the abdomen. So it's A to B and then B to A. And then they sit up. And then they stand up and then they walk. So at six months, they're probably just starting 
to sit and probably not sitting. They probably, most of them probably still need some assistance to sit at six months. So they should have been able to roll from front to back by this time. Cause that's like the second thing it's head and then rolling from front to back. That's usually like around four months. I think sitting without support that they shouldn't, let's see, which milestone should they have achieved, achieved, not in the process of figuring it out. So no, they should, they, they may be starting to sit without support, but that they haven't achieved it yet using a pincer grasp. So a pincer grasp is picking up small objects and they're not going to be able to do that until they're about a year old displaying stranger anxiety. Absolutely. Six month old y'all, they are like, ah, six month old. Where's my mom? It's like six months. Bam. Walking with assistance. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. So rolling over from front to back. That's I, It says it front to back, but I always say abdomen to back because I remember A to B and then B to A. Abdomen to back, then back to abdomen, then sitting, and then standing, and then walking. Crawling is not a developmental milestone because not all kids crawl. All right. I hope that helped you. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and rest of your weekend, whatever day it might be. So take care. Take, if you want, if you need an NCLEX review, go to Clinic Reviews. It is the best NCLEX review you will get out there, in my opinion, hands down to nothing. Nothing even comes close. Mark is doing reviews in Ohio, and we also have Clinic Reviews on demand. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Mwah. Bye.